All right, so this is chapter 24. We're still talking about digestion, uh, but this is part two. So we covered part one. Part one, we started talking about that alimentary canal, that tube that kind of runs through us. And we went through the mouth and then the throat, which is the back part of the mouth, the pharynx, and then down through the esophagus and then to the stomach. Okay? And, and then we moved out of the stomach to the small intestine. And so we've talked about some of the biomolecules that were broken down, you know, the biomolecules like proteins, um, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, fats, lipids. Um, those are the biomolecules that we're trying to digest. And um, so now, now that we've moved into the small intestine, or right there at the bridge between the stomach and the small intestine, is where we start seeing activity from the accessory organs. So the accessory organs aren't part of that tube. But, but they kind of make things that, that move into the small intestine. So we're going to talk about those. So this picture, again, is, is accurate-ish. Um, this shows the liver. The liver makes bile. Okay, And the gallbladder is supposed to store the bile, so the liver's mad because the liver gave the gallbladder the bile to store, and the, and the gallbladder did that, but then he got bored or whatever, and he started making gallstones. So gallstones are made by the gallbladder, and uh, he's a naughty, naughty gallbladder. <clears throat> and so it, it uses the components of the uh, bile products that comes from the liver, and it's, they sometimes make uh, gallstones. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Okay, <clears throat> especially what they're doing. So liver, gallbladder, pancreas, and this mentioned du mentions ducts. So the ducts are just the things that are carrying stuff. So if we look here, we, we have the liver that kind of sits up here on the right side of your body. And it kind of, it's huge. So it kind of moves all over. It doesn't move, but it's, but it's big. Um, but it's, it's what's making the bile. And so it moves from the bile, and we can kind of look to the... Um, to the, the text over here. So the bile moves through the hepatic duct to the gallbladder, and then in the gallbladder it's stored and concentrated. Now, the bile in general, so, so to put it simply, we're going to have a whole slide on what bile and bile salts are, but bile in general is going to help you break down fats, okay? So one of the tricks that the body has is, now the liver is constantly making bile, but you don't want to squirt it here because ultimately, if we kind of continue this story, um, it moves through this common bile duct and then out here to the small intestine, along with the pancreatic duct, which kind of moves together, and they move their stuff into the small intestine. Now, the thing is, you don't really, it's not very efficient to move these digestive products into the small intestine unless there's something there. So a lot of feedback comes from either stretching or just the presence of food, especially the presence of fat, will tell your gallbladder to squeeze and pushes that bile out into the small intestine. Okay, so, um, so if we read through this, the gallbladder stores and concentrates bile until activated by something called cholecystokinin. So we're gonna call it CCK because that's easier. And and so, yeah, that, that presence of food or that presence of fat or just a signal from the brain can tell it to do that. It can say, okay, we're eating now, there's food now, get ready. And that's when it pushes those bile salts out or the bile. Okay, bile moves through the common bile duct, joins the pancreatic duct. Bile and pancreatic secretions move into the duodenum. So at the same time, your pancreas is getting those signals saying, hey, we need to start pushing stuff out. It pushes bicarbonate out. That's one of the things I think we learned about last time to neutralize the stomach acid, okay? Because stomach acid is moving into that duodenum, and so it needs to neutralize that. So it puts bicarbonate in there. So bicarbonate is something that you would see like in an antacid to, uh, to neutralize acid. Um, okay, so the bile pancreatic secretions move into the duodenum. So the accessory pancreatic duct empties pancreatic secretions into the duodenum at the minor duodenal papilla. So not too worried about the names of those things. You are going to be, you know, kind of concentrating on learning how the signaling takes place, things like CCK. Um, uh, but those, those ducts are how they, kind of how they get there. So let's talk about bile. Remember, bile is made by the liver, okay? And the liver constantly makes bile. It's constantly dripping it out. That's why you have a gallbladder. If you didn't have a gallbladder, 
then you would just be dripping out bile into your small intestine all the time. Not a big deal, but it makes it harder when you have like a big fatty meal. Uh, if you have a big fatty meal and you have a gallbladder, then that gallbladder can say, ooh, there's a whole bunch of food that's there and squeeze a bunch of bile out. If you don't have a lot of uh, gallbladder, which a lot of people don't, then your liver can still, it's still making the bile. Uh, it's just dripping it out a little by little all day. So if you have a big fatty meal, you, you might be in trouble. And we'll kind of talk about why. Um, so hepatocytes, which are liver cells, hepato means liver and cytes means cells. They secrete 800 to 1,000 milliliters of bile every day. So 1,000 milliliters is a liter, so about, about that much. So bile is mostly, well, of course, water and bile salts. So bile salts, if we kind of look down here where it's, I guess green matches green there, bile salts help to emulsify fats, okay? So this is a, this is a term that kind of confuses people a lot. Emulsify doesn't mean break them down, really, not enzymatically break, it, break them down. I mean, it breaks them down, but if you take a big blob of fat, what bile salts do is they allow it to be tiny droplets of fat. Okay? So it's not like breaking the fat molecules apart, but it's taking that big blob and it's turning it into something that enzymes can really deal with. Enzymes trying to deal with or break down fat in a, uh, that's in a big blob like that, it's going to take it forever. So if you can kind of increase the surface area and turn it into a bunch of little ones, then that's something the enzymes can really chew on. Okay, so bile salts, cholesterol. So your liver makes cholesterol. It makes cholesterol for use in your body, and it also sends cholesterol out of the body through the bile. Okay, uh, so cholesterol is found in bile. Remember, we're talking about bile here. So bile salts, cholesterol is found in there. And really, when we, we were just talking about the uh, uh, gallstones, and gallstones are primarily made from cholesterol. They're little balls of cholesterol, in a sense, and they're kind of shiny and, and beautiful, um, but you don't want to have them in your gallbladder. Now, bile pigments, bile pigments is something else that, that can be kind of confusing sometimes. Usually when we think of a pigment, we think of a pigment, we think of paint or something that gives color to something and makes it beautiful. Okay, well, what happens when you, you know, cut somebody open and they have blood? I mean, I don't know if beautiful is the way you would describe that, but it's bright red. Okay, so that's done by a pigment. And the pigment in that case is heme, okay? So maybe hemoglobin, and um, which is what carries oxygen in our blood. So heme is broken down into bilirubin. So these are called pigments because they, I guess, impart some kind of a color. They, they have a color to them. Um, but, in, but in the liver or in bile, it's bilirubin. And bilirubin is kind of a yellow color. So if we kind of follow this through, you have blood cells with hemoglobin in them. In the hemoglobin is heme. Okay? It's just a molecule. It's a big molecule, but it's just a molecule. That heme is broken down into bilirubin. Okay. And bilirubin is yellow. Okay? So if you're if you're so we can piece this together. If it's your liver's responsibility, it's its job to get rid of bilirubin, which we're calling bile pigments here, to get rid of bilirubin, if your liver doesn't work, the bilirubin stays in your body. Bilirubin is yellow, and that's what causes jaundice. Okay, So remember that. That's what we're talking about. Um, so bilirubin is the principal bile pigment released by the liver. Um, it's the liver conjugates it or sticks it to something so it can move out is what it, is what it really does. But bilirubin is derived from the heme of recycled blood cells. So now we have two different colors. We have heme, which is red. So that's, you know, we'll call that a pigment. We'll, we'll call the heme a pigment. Bilirubin, which is yellow. So that's a pigment. But then he, bilirubin itself is then broken down into some, something called stercobalin in the intestine. And that's going to give feces its brown color. I guess brown is a color. And uh, the breakdown product in urine is urobalin, which is what gives urine its color. So that's why we call them pigments, because they impart some kind of a color. Um, excess bilirubin in the urine indicates liver malfunction associated with jaundice. 
Okay. Um, and jaundice can indicate whether or not the liver is functioning, right? Because if the liver is not functioning, then the bilirubin stays in the body and causes that yellow color. So like in preemies, a lot of people have heard about that. In premature infants, they, uh, they turn yellow, they become jaundiced. And that's because their liver doesn't work yet. It hasn't fully functioned or it hasn't fully developed. So it's not functional and so, or not fully functional. So, so that bilirubin builds up in an infant, okay? All right, so let's talk specifically what, about what bile salts do. Uh, I kind of mentioned earlier that it takes the big blobs of fat and turns them into little blobs. Remember, fat isn't soluble. So if you eat a big fatty meal, you know, I don't know, McDonald's cheeseburger or something like that, that fat's going to kind of glob together. And, and it's really hard for enzymes to break that down. So you have these things, these bile salts, um, and essentially what they do is one side of them likes fat and the other side likes water. And so they kind of surround little pieces. They kind of stick to the big blob and they turn it into little um, droplets. And once they're little droplets, that increases the surface area. So this is really isn't to scale, but, but the enzymes can then get in there and really chew on them and really break down the fats themselves. Okay, so bile salts, we, the word for that is emulsify. So the bile salts emulsify the fats. So surround them and break them up into smaller droplets. And then lipases. Remember, ACE means it's an enzyme. It ends in ACE. So a lipase is going to break down lipids. Okay. So lipids are going to break down the actual fats. Okay. So emulsifiers just took big blob, turned it into little droplets. Lipases actually break down the fat. So you can have um, uh, triglycerides and you can break those down into monoglycerides, for instance. So a triglyceride has the three tails and a monoglyceride may have just one tail. And then fatty acids, which fatty acids are just the tails. Okay, So that's what we're talking about when we actually break them apart. That's what lipases do. So then those fats are absorbed. So the blobs or the blobs and droplets can't be absorbed, but these fats, these monosac mono monoglycerides and fatty acids can be absorbed. Okay. And then and then they move really they mostly move into the uh, into the lymph system. Okay, they can move directly into the blood, but they primarily move into the uh, into the lymph system. So fats move into the into the lymph system. And so without bile salts, fat digestion is very limited. So if we kind of go through this again, um, bile secretion. So here's our liver. And so remember, the gallbladder just stores bile until the vas vagus nerve or cholecystokinin, CCK, stimulates contraction of the bladder. Okay. Um, so CCK is activated in the presence of lipids. So we said that before, when you eat that cheeseburger and it gets into, it goes through the stomach and gets into the small intestine, it will cause the release of CCK. CCK will say, hey, gallbladder, squeeze your bile out. And that's what the gallbladder does. And then no matter how fatty it is, hopefully, uh, it should be able to break down those big blobs into smaller blobs. It should be able to um, emulsify those. Okay, so lots of bile is released at just the right time when we eat a meal with fat. Uh, CCK, incidentally, also sends a signal back up to the, the brain in a roundabout way and says, hey, we've got food, we're not hungry anymore. Okay. So, so it's a, yeah, it acts as a hunger suppressant. So you're constantly kind of monitoring that. And if you're saying, gosh, they should make drugs that do that, they've tried and they have. And uh, there are a lot of drugs that do suppress your appetite um, that, are, that are out there, okay, that, that you can't just take because they also have a lot of other adverse side effects. All right, so you can live without a gallbladder, but what are the consequences? Well, that means that when you eat that cheeseburger and you don't have a gallbladder, you're still just getting the drip, drip, drip from the liver. Okay? You don't have that big rush of, of bile that comes at just the right time. Uh, so you might be able to eat something fatty, but you'd have to spread it out over time. If not, you've got blobs of fat, loose stools, diarrhea, 
uh, unpleasantness. It, it can cause some uh, intestinal motility problems and, and uh, uh, GI discomfort. So uh, most people, most people when they, I say most people because a lot of people don't pay any attention, but if they're missing their gallbladder, uh, they tend to have to uh, really, really watch their diet, especially, especially their fat intake. All right, so other functions of the liver. The liver, liver's one of these things that we know it's important. I think in biology class, you learn it as like the chemical factory of the cell, or I don't know, well, I don't know what, what it's called, but, uh, but it's, it's an organ that, that does so many things that it's almost confusing about what it actually does. Well, one of the things we know that it does is make bile. Um, but some other things, remember you have amino acids and Maybe you've heard of essential amino acids and non-essential amino acids. Maybe you haven't. But if it's non-essential, that means your body can make it. Well, it's not your body that makes those amino acids. It's your liver. Okay, So that's one of the things that it does. And then it can just push those off into blood vessels. Okay, uh, Turn sugar into glycogen. Okay? Glycogen is the storage form of sugar. So when you eat a big meal that's really sugary, then you release insulin, and insulin says, hey, go into liver cells and, and or fat cells or muscle cells. But it goes, but a large majority or a lot of it goes into liver cells. And then the liver will store that as these big chains, these polysaccharide chains of glycogen until you need it later, okay? Um, which means the liver doesn't just, it turns sugar into glycogen for storage, but it can also then on the other side of that give you sugar or glucose really. Uh, when you need it. So fats into low density lipoproteins, a lipoprotein, this is really what we're talking about when we call, uh, when we talk about cholesterol, um, low density lipoproteins, high density, intermediate density, very low density. There are a lot of densities of lipoproteins, but really we're talking about with lipoproteins, lipid proteins. So it's lipids mixed with proteins. Uh, so we're talking about fats, and a lot of times LDLs have a lot of cholesterol in them. So, so that's another thing the liver does, is it makes cholesterol. Uh, we don't get all of our cholesterol from our diet. Uh, if you go on a low cholesterol diet, your liver will start making more cholesterol in general. Um, another thing that it does, activation or the hydroxylation of vitamin D. Uh, vitamin D is sort of a, uh, well, it's a vitamin, vitamin hormone. Uh, that helps you absorb calcium. That's one of the things that it does. Uh, detoxification. So another thing is you've got blood moving through here. And I think that's probably an important thing to consider. And we'll, I think we'll see a picture of this later. But really, when you absorb food from your gut, it goes into this hepatic portal system. And, um, and it, it, really the food right after it's absorbed or anything that you absorb, and that's why this is important, pretty much kind of goes right to your liver. And so your liver can kind of get rid of any toxins that are in there or, you know, or good stuff too, like, like sugars and fats. Um, so it goes right to your liver and can break stuff down before it goes into circulation. Okay. So that's kind of a, kind of a simplified way of saying that. But, um, but you've constantly got blood flowing through the liver and there are enzymes in the liver that can break it down. It can break down toxins. It can break down um, drugs. So most drugs are broken down in the liver. Okay, so they remove ammonia and convert it to urea. That's, a, that's another thing that's done. Breakdown of proteins is what that's describing. So phagocytosis of worn out and dying red, red and white blood cells, some bacteria, synthesis of many active proteins. So here's a whole list. And I have two of them underlined, albumins and clotting factor. We haven't really talked about albumin, but albumin is a protein that's in your blood all the time. Right? And, it's, and it's important that it's there because it, um, it kind of keeps your blood volume high enough. So it, it increases that um, osmotic potential in your blood to keep your blood volume high. Uh, clotting factors are for clotting. So if your liver is bad, you're not going to be able to make clotting factors, also anti-clotting factors, but, but that's going to interfere with your, your clotting. Uh, just liver damage will do that. It's liver failure. That's why people can't really, you can't live without a liver. Okay. Uh, so I mentioned the he hepatic portal vein earlier. Um, and so I kind of wrote, wrote it out here. Hopefully 
that'll make more sense if the way I explained it didn't. But many nutrients go straight to the liver from the intestine. They go through it via the hepatic portal system or the hepatic portal vein after being absorbed. Okay, so and that's that's kind of a safety feature. Get it to the liver where the liver can detoxify it as quickly as possible. Okay, so the it, small intestine is also secretory, and when we say secretory, we mean that it is secreting things that are going to aid in digestion, okay? Uh, or protection in the case of mucus. So it secretes mucus, protects everything along the way, along your GI system, along your alimentary canal, everything along the way has mucus on it. And so you've constantly got mucus being secreted from the esophagus, mouth, stomach, small intestine, everything. Um, so mucus protects against digestive enzymes and stomach acids, duodenal glands, they, stimulated by the vagus nerve, secretin, it's a chemical or tactile irritation of duodenal mucosa. Okay, so I think we are going to talk about secretin later. If not, then that's okay. Um, let's see, digestive enzymes. So these are the big ones that we have to think about right now. Uh, Digestive enzymes bound to the membranes of the absorptive cells. So you have digestive enzymes that are kind of kind of sitting out here. I don't know if you can see my pen right in there, but kind of sitting out here, breaking down proteins, nucleic acids, um, and carbohydrates. Okay? Um, so disaccharides break down disaccharides into monosaccharides. Remember, a disaccharide are two sugars kind of stuck together and a monosaccharide is just one. So glucose is an example of a monosaccharide and sucrose is an example of a disaccharide. Well, if you eat chains, like, I mean, sucrose is only two in the chain. If you think of uh, like starch, starch is a long, long chain. Those have to all be broken down into monosaccharides before they can be absorbed for the most part, right? So that's why they talk about how complex carbohydrates are better for you because it takes longer to digest them because it has to break all these apart. Okay? So that's why they're better for you. You eat you know, a Snickers bar with fructose and glucose in it. Uh, well, that's, that's gonna, that doesn't take much at all before it's absorbed. So your, your blood glucose levels are just going to spike after you eat something really, really sweet. Okay. Uh, kind of a... Uh, precursor to nutrition there. All right, so di disaccharides are broken down into uh, monosaccharides, peptidases. Peptides are chains of amino acids or proteins, okay? So a protein is usually considered over 100 amino acids. If it's less than 100, then sometimes we call it a peptide, but it's the same thing. It's a chain of amino acids. Um, so they're held together by peptide bonds. And peptidases, proteases, break those down. Okay, so it breaks apart those uh, those those links that are holding those amino acids together. Um, peptidases, hydrolyzed peptide bonds, nucleases break down nucleic acids. That's like deoxyribonucleic acid, ribonucleic acid, DNA, RNA. Okay, so those are broke down too. Um, and then we actually then break down our own enzymes, okay? So we release enzymes and then those are out there and they're broken down by other enzymes and it's just a, it's just a mess and we, we reabsorb those too. Okay, so modifications of the small intestine, here we're talking about the small intestine, to increase the surface area. So there are a lot of features that if you were to break open a, uh, an intestine, you would see that it is not smooth on the inside. That would be very, I don't want to say bad, but inefficient because you want to have it rougher because you can kind of see just from this picture here that if you have a smooth surface, you really only have, you know, this much surface area for absorption. But if you can rough it up a little bit, then you can have a lot more surface area for absorption. Okay. So, I mean, I think you can kind of kind of get the idea there. You've got a lot more surface area if you if you kind of fold it up. So there are circular folds. There are villi. So villi. So here's a picture of villi right there. Okay. 
So those, you can see, that's a lot more surface area than if this was just flat. Okay. So they contain capillaries, blood, and lacteals. So what that means, or, or lymph. So what that means is that they're producing enzymes, but you can also absorb stuff right into those. Let me go back to black here. So you've got enzymes being made, but then you can absorb stuff right into those with all of that surface area. Uh, microvilli, you have microvilli that sit on top of the villi. So you can kind of see that picture over here. If this whole big thing here is a villus, then on top of that are microvilli. Even more surface area. It's insane. If you take the surface area of your small intestines and just kind of flatten it all out with all the villi, microvilli, and circular folds, it would be roughly the size of a football field. Okay, um, I've heard that, you know, if you read something else and it says it's like more like three-fourths of a football field, it doesn't matter. It's still a lot of surface area. So kind of kind of makes the point. Um, let's see. All right, so what's happening? So we've been talking about chemical digestion. Well, that's enzymes. Enzymes, enzymes are going to chemically digest things. But then we have the, uh, the mechanical digestion. So you have mixing and propulsion. Okay, So you have uh, segmental contractions are what's going to go back and forth and mix it. And then you have peristalsis, which kind of pushes it in one direction. So uh, segmental contractions mix it. Peristalsis propels increases digestion and absorption in the small intestine. So it's kind of like if you're trying to mix something up and get it like good and, I don't know, in this case digested, then moving it back and forth, kind of turning it in a circle is all gonna, is all gonna help and the circular folds kind of do that. All right, so what take, digestion takes place in the small intestine? Easy, easy answer. Pretty much all of it. All of the biomolecules are broken down in the, uh, in the small intestine. Okay, so proteins, uh, so proteins broken down by proteases break down those peptide bonds, um, which are the bonds between the amino acids, which result in short peptide fragments and individual amino acids, and that's what can be absorbed. Lipids, triglycerides are reduced to monoglycerides and fatty acids, so that's what I was mentioning earlier. There's a better picture of it. This is a triglyceride. This is a monoglyceride. It only has one tail instead of three. And then those other two tails are broken off and they're just free fatty acids. Okay. All right, carbohydrates, polysaccharides, and disaccharides are reduced to monosaccharides. So we mentioned that as well. Glucose is an example. Glucose and fructose are examples of monosaccharides. So we can see that here. Uh, fructose, there's glucose. Galactose is broken down from uh, lact uh, galactose is broken down from lactose. Okay, all right. You don't have to really know all those, but that's that's what we're talking about: taking chains and turning them into monosaccharides. All right, nucleic acids by nucleases. Really, those are just restriction enzymes that break them, break them apart. Okay, uh, as chyme moves, so yeah, to individual nucleotides. So as chyme, and we're calling it chyme now. I think we mentioned that last time. We can't call it food anymore. Now it's mixed with stomach juices, uh, fluid from the stomach, and so it's not really food anymore, so now we call it chyme. So as chyme moves from the duodenum and through the jejunum, which is the next part of the small intestine, and ileum, which is the last part, narrowing takes place and the surface area decreases. Chyme reaches the ilio, chyme reaches the ilio for ileum, the last part of the small intestine. So we've kind of moved down like that. It's gotten a little smaller. And then you get to the cecum of the large intestine. Okay. And there's a little appendix that sits there. All right. So chyme reaches the ileocecal valve. So there's a valve right there between the small intestine and the large intestine, or between the ileum of the small intestine and the cecum of the large intestine. There's a valve. It's a sphincter. Um, so separating the small intestine from the large intestine. So I guess that's where we are. Uh, we're moving from the uh, small intestine to the large intestine, just moving right along. So chyme is allowed into the large intestine a little at a time. And it's so funny because it's, it's kind of this stretching thing. We saw that in the stomach too. 
it's like it opens up a little bit and then it moves into the large intestine. The large intestine stretches a little and says, oh, no, no, shut it down, shut it down. And it just keeps doing that. It opens it, lets a little in. The large intestine says, oh, okay, that's enough. Closes it, opens it, closes it, and just lets a little bit go through at a time. Okay, so the ileus sphincter remains slightly contracted until peristaltic waves reach it. It relaxes, allowing chyme to move into the cecum of the large intestine. The cecum stretches because chyme got into it which causes a reflex and it says close it again and the ileocecal valve closes again. So you push, you have these uh, peristaltic wave, pushes food forward, opens the valve, the cecum stretches, says close the valve and it just keeps doing that. That's just how it moves. Okay. So increases digestion absorption and absorption in the small intestine by slowing that, pro that progress of the chyme. And it also prevents the, the valve, I guess, or the, or the sphincter muscle, really, uh, prevents food from moving back from the small intestine to the large intestine. So this is the area we're talking about right here from the, uh, from the ileum. I get my ileum and jejunum mixed up sometimes. From the ileum to the cecum. Okay. So the cecum is that very first kind of enlarged part of the large intestine. And the rest of this is all what we call the colon. Okay, so activity in the large intestine extends from the ileocecal junction to the anus. Okay, so you've got the ascending, transverse, and descending colon, and then that moves all the way to the anal canal. Okay, so cecum, first part, colon, the middle part, rectum is that kind of S-shaped area, and then the anus is the, uh, the anal canal or the opening from the anus. Okay, so movements are sluggish, 18 to 24 hours to move through it. Chyme is converted into feces because it's not really chyme anymore. Now it's poop, so we call it feces. Uh, some absorption of water and salts happens here. Most, I'm going to say this now because I want to make sure I say it. Most absorption, absorption of food and water, food and water, happens in the small intestine. Now, the reason we talk about, and a lot of times what you'll hear is that most water absorption happens in the large intestine. That's not really true. The, uh, the small intestine makes a lot of water and absorbs a lot of water. By volume, more water is actually absorbed in the small intestine. But the large intestine doesn't really do a whole lot more okay, than, than absorb water. So, so that's one of the things that, that we talk about in terms of function. But don't be misled in thinking that, that, that it does it more than the small intestine. The small intestine is way more busy. So absorption of water and salts, secretion of mucus, extensive action of microorganisms. Now, the extensive action of microorganisms, that is one thing that the large intestine is kind of the king of. Um, there are a lot of microorganisms, um, your uh, flora, intestinal flora, but bacteria kind of live in here and break things down. So any... So while no enzymes, no enzymatic activity, not really, no enzymatic activity, anything that's broken down is really done by, uh, I'm going to just use the word bacteria, because that's mainly what we're talking about. Uh, anything that's broken down is broken down by bacteria. And that's important. It's important that it does that. Without the bacteria, we would, we would all be in a lot of trouble. Okay. Um, so about 1,500 milliliters of chyme enter the cecum, 90% of volume reabsorbing, yielding 80 to 50 milliliters of feces. There, you, you know that. I'm not going to ask it on the test. All right, uh, so secretions of the large intestine. So this is kind of what I, what I just said. Mucus provides protection, but there is no significant secretion of digestive enzymes in the large intestine. Intestinal flora, many bacteria live in the intestines. Most live in the large intestine. There is, There are bacteria also living in the small intestine. Most are, have been found so far in the, uh, in the large intestine. So what are the bacteria doing? They produce acid uh, and uh, they remove, let's see, bacteria produce acid and the following remove acid from epithelial cells that lie in the large intestine. Uh, so exchange of bicarbonate ions for chloride ions, exchange of sodium ions for hydrogen ions. I think um, what we really are, are after when, 
if we if we get into the specifics of what bacteria does, we could we could be here forever, um, because because they do a lot of very individual things. Uh, so we're going to focus on a few uh, more noticeable things. So bacterial action produces gas, flatulence. So when we have a gurgling stomach with air in there, it's not because you swallowed air. I mean, it could be if you swallow a lot of air, but it could also be because bacteria, when it's breaking down stuff, will produce uh, gases. So bacteria will produce gases from particular kinds of carbohydrates found in legumes. So that's, that's a big source of it. So beans, so eating beans gives you gas, okay? And then artificial sugars like sorbitol, if you have a lot of those, I guess, that's, that's kind of there too. Um, bacteria produce vitamin K, which is then absorbed. Uh, B12 is another one that's kind of made from bacteria that through the food that you eat. It's usually found in meat products, but it's really from bacteria that make it. Uh, feces consists of water, undigested food or cellulose, which is uh, um, like fibers microorganisms sloughed off epithelial cells. So just a bunch of junk, um, leftover junk. So having the right or wrong gut bacteria can make you thin or obese. Okay, so I'm gonna tell a little story about this and there's a link in your, in your slides, I think. Um, but there were two cages of rats. They did this experiments, two cages of rats or mice, they were mice. And over here, that's a mouse. And over here, you had different, you had different groups. These guys were fat, okay? These were fat mice. And these are skinny mice. And what they learned is that when they flipped cages, the fat mice would become skinny and the skinny mice would become fat. And they figured out that what, would hap what was happening is that mice are gross and they eat each other's poop. And so when they put the fat mice into the skinny mouse cage, and of course they, they got rid of the skinny mouse and they actually put him over here. But when they put that fat mouse into the skinny mouse's cage, whatever gut bacteria that the skinny mouse had now is in the fat mouse. And they figured out that the fat mouse would actually, uh, and when I say fat, I mean obese, they were big, would actually lose weight. Okay, So there's something in the uh, intestinal flora that that was causing this is this is what they uh, concluded anyway that was causing the mice to lose weight okay so having a right or wrong gut bacteria can make you thin or obese uh, also heart disease risk um, so certain bacteria will will feed on will feed on different things and I, I don't want to get too much into this but but you should I mean it's really interesting to check out uh, the thing about probiotics and people taking probiotics is that the only bacteria that are going to live in your gut are the bacteria that you feed. If you eat steak all the time, you're going to have bacteria that like steak. If you're a vegan and you don't eat steak, you aren't going to have those bacteria. Not really, not unless you're just eating the bacteria every day. So, so really the bacteria that live inside you are the bacteria that you feed. Uh, but some of these bacteria that eat steak will make, uh, I think it's like carnitine or something like that, that increases heart disease risk. Okay. Uh, and the more we learn about these gut bacteria, the more important we're, we're figuring out that they are. All right, so let's kind of go through some of these mechanisms real quick. Um, we've kind of talked about some of these processes, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. But glucose goes to the liver through the bloodstream and the portal vein. So, so we're kind of going back, so we're kind of jumping back. We've already been through the, uh, all of the areas, stomach, small intestine, large intestine. So we're going to go back and we're just going to talk about absorption. So in this case, we're talking about absorption that's taking place in the small intestine. So remember those, um, those polysaccharides or complex carbohydrates, they're broken down into these monosaccharides. Okay, so we're going to focus on glucose. And so glucose has to move in. So if we think about how glucose moves in, Glucose is hydrophilic, which means that it cannot cross through the membrane. If it were hydrophobic, you know, if it were more, more fatty instead of having all of these um, like oxygens on them on, near the outside, if they didn't have the oxygen, then they'd just be able to move right through, okay? But they do. And so they can't really move through fats 
they can't move, well, they can move through fats, but they can't move through the, the uh, uh, cell membrane. So they need something to carry it. And ultimately what, what carries it is, is sodium. So sodium, it's a, uh, sodium will come in and it has to bring the glucose with it. With it. So um, yeah, uh, we, we learned that as a sim porter. So, so, so sodium can come in, but it has to bring glucose with it. And that's how it moves through. Okay. And that, that sodium is powered by the sodium potassium pump. That's why there's no sodium in there. And so sodium's constantly going in and it's constantly bringing glucose with it if it can't. And then there are just channels over here that allow it to, uh, to move out, okay? And it moves into your blood. Okay, so that's kind of a, a simplified version of, uh, believe it or not, of what's, of what's happening. Um, if we look at lipids, so I just mentioned that lipids kind of just go wherever they want to. They don't have any of the, uh, they don't have really the oxygen. They don't have the, uh, I guess the, the hydrogen bonding that can take place. They're really kind of not very interesting. They don't have a lot of electrical charge potential or polarity or anything. So they can just, if they're small enough, they'll just move right in. Okay. So they just move in through simple diffusion. Okay because they're lipophilic or hydrophobic. Okay, so to be absorbed, they have to form small sphere of lipids or a micelle with the help of bile salts. So that's something else that bile salts can do. And, uh, and then those can move in and then they reform into uh, triglycerides. So then they are converted into triglycerides and coated with proteins in the cell, which is a chylomicron, that's what we call that, moves into the lymph. And then from the lymph, um, they make their way to the liver and to fat tissue, uh, and that's how that's how uh, lipids get in. So so they start out here, they're emulsified and then uh, broken down into these monosaccharides and, and fatty acids, and then those are moved in. Those move in passively, and then they turn into a micelle. And a micelle is just really just has has uh, uh, phospholipids around it, and uh, and that kind of allows it to move in, in fluid, okay? <coughs> or coated with protein, sorry. All right, they make their way back. They make their way back into the blood and move to adipose tissue or the liver for redistribution, actually both, okay? All right, so amino acids. Amino acids, they have to be broken down. Remember, you don't want to absorb a full protein. Okay. Proteins do things. If you just ate, I don't know, a tiger, then the tiger's proteins, you don't want those to be active in you because then they would do things they did in the tiger. I know that sounds stupid, but, but you don't want active proteins that are doing something in, to just be absorbed into your body because they would be active in your body. So they have to be broken down into these individual amino acids or maybe dipeptides, uh, maybe short, like short chains, but nothing that can be active. That's the key, okay? So they must be broken down before being absorbed. Functional proteins entering your body would be very bad, okay? So it's mostly they're single amino acids, but also some dipeptides, tripeptides, some very short chain peptides, usually less than 10 amino acids in length. Uh, those are gonna be moved in kind of like we saw with glucose, with the uh, sodium symporter, and then they move into the blood and usually right to the liver okay where they can where they can be reassembled or wherever wherever amino acids are needed all right so the last thing that we're going to talk about um are low so very low low and high density lipoproteins so this is going to take a minute sorry i know we're getting close to the end we only have two, i think two or three more slides but but these are kind of complicated and there are always questions about them. So when we have fats, and this is something everybody really kind of should know because we always hear about our good cholesterol and our bad cholesterol. And really, we're talking about with bad cholesterol, we're talking about low-density lipoproteins. Our good cholesterol are high-density, so H for happy, high-density lipoproteins. And then we have these things called very low density, and we have others too, but we're not going to talk about them. So what we're kind of talking about is how fat moves around in our body. Fat tends to blob up. So we can't just have fats just squirted in into our blood system and into our bloodstream because it would blob up just like, you know, when you put oil in water. 
So it has to be covered by proteins and phospholipids. So we can kind of see that here. The blue here are the phospholipids. And then there are proteins that are kind of stuck in there. So when we, when we get these fats or when we eat these fats, um, we end up with something, first of all, and these can be made by the, by the liver as well. The liver, remember, can, can make fats and uh, cholesterol. But VLDLs, very low density lipoproteins, because they don't have a lot of protein. This is a VLDL down here. They don't have a lot of proteins, but they do have, and if we look at these amounts here, they do have a lot of triglycerides. Okay? Not, not so much cholesterol, only about 14% cholesterol, but very low density have a lot of triglycerides. So if you get a, a CBC or a complete blood count and they look at your triglyceride levels, this is mainly what they're looking at. They're looking at very low density lipoproteins. Well, then you have, so, so these, these triglycerides can be dropped off at adipose tissue, at fat cells. Well, what that does is it tends to leave a lot of cholesterol behind, and now you end up with low-density lipoproteins. Okay? So they're low-density because now you have more proteins but less fat, which makes them a little less dense, but, um, I'm sorry, a little more dense. They were very low, and now they're just low because they have more proteins, and proteins are denser. But even though they got rid of the triglycerides, they left behind cholesterol. And so these low-density lipoproteins tend to be what we call bad cholesterol. And they're bad cholesterol because there's a lot of cholesterol, and that cholesterol can leave. Okay? That's sort of the reason. It also has to do with their size and what they end up doing. But... Um, but that's what they're doing. And so, so the liver can make these, and all of your cells need cholesterol. Cholesterol is important. We need it to live. And your cells need it to, to function. So, so the liver, the LDLs, is really a way to move cholesterol through your blood uh, in, a, in a more soluble way. So LDLs are the main carriers of cholesterol. The needy cells, they express a receptor when they need it. Um, okay, these apo, apoproteins here that are on the outside. And, but the trouble is, and we're not going to get into the details no matter how badly I want to, but these low-density lipoproteins can kind of get into blood vessels, and they cause atherosclerosis. That's why they're bad, which can cause clotting and death. Okay, So, so LDLs are bad because they do that. They can, they can damage blood vessels, cause atherosclerosis, and then that can cause a stroke or a heart attack or something like that. Well, then along come, or actually we have these other things called HDLs, high-density lipoproteins. High-density lipoproteins have much less cholesterol, and they're mostly just protein and phospholipids. That's not dangerous at all. In fact, the role that we've seen of HDLs, or high-density lipoproteins, is to move cholesterol to sort of scavenge cholesterol. Uh, so from membranes, transport it to the liver and some endocrine cells. So, um, yeah. So if we look at this in a in more of a picture way and kind of simplify it, low-density lipoproteins are the bad cholesterol. They leave deposits on vessel walls as they take lipids to cells. So this is our bad cholesterol guy here. I'll make it a different color. This is our bad cholesterol guy making a mess. High-density lipoproteins are good cholesterol. They clean up deposits in the blood as well as removing lipids from cells. So this is our good cholesterol here, our HDL. Okay. So research shows that the distribution of LDLs and HDLs is genetically determined as well as affected by diet. So we used to think that our cholesterol level was pretty much mostly affected by diet, but we've learned that it is genetic. And... Uh, and so there are medications that can help um, other diseases. This also mentions other diseases. Levels of HDLs are found to be lower in diabetics. Okay? So, so yeah, there are certain statin drugs, things like that, because that can lower your low-density low lipoproteins. It can be controlled by diet. That's really important. I'm not saying that it can't be. Uh, but it's not just controlled by diet. Okay? So a lot of people that eat a great diet, nice, nice, you know, Mediterranean diet or whatever, um, will, can still have high LDLs and low HDLs. All right, so this is the last slide. I don't think there's anything really, really new here. It just kind of, kind of puts things together. 
uh, some of the stuff that we've talked about. Uh, one thing that it does introduce is the con control of di digestion uh, occurs in phases that work independently. We have the cephalic phase. Cephalic refers to the brain or the, uh, yeah, the brain. So the brain via the vagus nerve, we can think about food and start salivating. We can think about food and increase our stomach motility. Our stomach starts saying, mm, yeah, we're getting food, we're getting food. Um, whether you are or aren't, your brain can sort of trick your stomach into thinking that it is. Uh, the enteric nervous system, which is your gut brain, uh, is primarily self-controlled based on stretching and distension. So your gut kind of knows what to do based on simple feedback that it gets. When it stretches, there's food there. Uh, if it's fats, it sends in, um, it sends in uh, uh, bile salts, things like that, the different enzymes. Okay. Um, so the gastric phase is the stomach. Gastric, remember that? Gastric refers to stomach, like gastric bypass. You're bypassing the stomach. Um, intestinal phase includes the intestine. Okay, so this does put a lot of stuff together. I'm not going to talk about it much here, but remember our salivary amylase, li lingual lipase, uh, gastric lipase, pepsin, uh, bile salts, pancreatic lipase. We've talked about a lot of these things, and a lot of these things you have to know. Um, so, so this kind of, I don't know if you work well with a graph like this or a picture like this, then then have at it, but otherwise, that's the last slide.